Welcome to Catholic Feedback. I'm your host, Keith Nestor. On this podcast, we connect the eternal truths of the Catholic faith with everyday life. Send in your questions and comments to feedback at catholicfeedback.com. This podcast is brought to you by Down to Earth Ministry, a ministry of stewardship, a mission of faith, and by the generous support of our patrons. For more information, please visit downtoearthministry.org. That's down, the number two, earthministry.org. Let's get to it. Hey everybody, welcome to St. Michael Barbell Club. We're gonna head downstairs and we're gonna take a look at the gym and say hi to our good friend, Joe. Let's go. Joe, what's going on? Hey, welcome back, brother. How you doing? Good, good to see you. Welcome to my gym, yes. All right, give us a quick little tour of the St. Michael Barbell Club. Yeah, sure, let's walk over here. So this is kind of where all the main action happens. Over in this area, we got all the big weightlifting stuff, the racks, the benches, and all that. This is where all the big work gets done. Over there, we got all the machines, all that stuff, you know, all the accessories, all the little side side quests, if you will. Uh, over here, we got the strongman corner. So we got this is where I hang out over here in the strongman corner. Yes, <laughs> yes especially in like the key. We got the uh, farmer's care, we got the yoke, we got the bags, you know, all the all the essentials. This is the tire that I that I flip around all the time. And then uh, over here, of course, we have the Frodo bag. It's very important. Very important guy. Wonder. <laughs> awesome. And of course, check out this awesome lighted sign. This is so cool. Awesome. Well, show us some of the like Catholic -y stuff over here. This is always cool. Yeah. And so what do you got over here? We've got we got the crucifix, of course. We got the high octane epiphany holy water. We got uh, some prayer cards and some nice uh, literature just in case. And we got the catechism, essential. We got the imitation of Christ, and of course the manual for conquering deadly sin. Amen. Very, very Amen. Helpful. Well, here we are, my friends. St. Michael Barbell Club with Joe and Abnett, and uh, we're just excited to be here. I wanted to take some time today and let you guys get to know a little bit about Joe. He's a fascinating guy. I first met Joe when Estelle and I were on our journey into the Catholic faith, and we met at the home of another guy who's a Catholic convert, and you were there because you were on the same journey that we were in terms of the timing of it. You came in, I think, in Easter, and we had come in in October. Tell us a little bit about First of all, who is Joe and Abnett? How did you wind up being Catholic? And what's all this gym stuff all about? So my conversion to Catholicism is a long and strange tale, and it actually starts before I was born. It starts with my father. So my father, without giving away too much, he had a difficult childhood. He came from a broken home. He uh, had a very difficult time in his teens and his early 20s, made a lot of mistakes, and uh, got in a lot of trouble. And all that changed when he was 23 years old in the uh, you know, late 70s, early 80s, and he got into a truck accident where uh, the distance between life and death was very small. And he came out of that reflecting very hard on you know, how he was choosing to live his life. You know, he, uh, you know, he read The Lord of the Rings, and he started going to different churches and talking to different people, trying to learn things. And he got caught up in a movement which today, which uh, looking back, it was called the Jesus Movement. So you might be familiar with this. This was in the late 70s, early 80s. Basically, a lot of a lot of uh, reformed hippies who you know spent a lot of time you know going to Woodstock and doing drugs in the 60s and 70s. They started to find Jesus, and they would meet up in their basements and they would sing songs and they would break bread. And it was a very organic and very genuine, sincere conversion of heart that Christ really reached out. To him and made a big difference in his life and he went from uh, you know to absolute rock bottom to being married with six kids and uh, you know going to church every Sunday having a steady job which is you know more than he more than uh, he probably ever could have done without God in his life and so that was the tradition I was brought up in was a the uh, fundamentalist evangelical low church kind of Christianity and uh, I had a great childhood. I have no, you know, very little, you know, I don't have anything bad to say about the way I was raised, but the uh, simple childhood faith that I grew up with was 
limited in that uh, it hadn't really been tested in any way. And so when I got to be a teenager, our family situation changed a little bit. My dad had to get a new job. We had to move to a new town. My mom started working full time. And so, um, you know, I went from having, uh, you know, my parents around a lot to not having them around very much. And so I was at home by myself a lot. And in that time, I, uh, you know, I didn't fit in at the new school very well. And I felt very isolated and I kind of retreated to the internet. So I'm about 13 years old. You know, this is like 2003, 2004. And I was spending a lot of time on the internet looking at things and talking to people that I shouldn't really be getting involved with. And um, I start to encounter people who are not Christians, whether because they practice other religions or because they are, you know, they hate Christianity, they hate religion, they're big atheists and stuff like that. And I encountered all these ideas that I wasn't prepared to, to, uh, to fight against. So I encountered all these people who, for example, they were really into theory of evolution, into geology and the age of the earth and aliens. And, you know, if, if God is real, why don't amputees grow their arms back when they pray and stuff like that? And so uh, all those things are, are uh, you know, not good reasons to stop believing in God, of course. But I was 13 years old and I hadn't really considered these things before. And gradually, you know, year by year, this stuff kind of wore down on me. And then I, against my own will, I became an atheist. I sort of lost my faith in God. And I, it, it was not intentional, it was not what I wanted, but it just sort of happened that way. And that was, that started kind of a very sad period for me where, you know, I basically, you know, nothing in my life made sense anymore. And uh, I didn't have any context for it. And I started asking the adults in my life for help. And this is where things kind of went a little bit more sour. So my dad, of course, was a great uh, role model in the religious life, but he worked 50, 60 hours a week. And people on, and when he wasn't around, I could ask people on the internet for their advice. And I started talking to my friends at school, which I didn't have very many, but I talked to them. I would talk to the uh, youth pastor at the evangelical church we went to, and none of them really had any good advice or good reasons why I should believe in Jesus. At least it didn't seem so at the time. You know, I would I would bring all these concerns to them, and the answer was like, you know, you, know, you just gotta have faith in Jesus. You know, you gotta trust that that's that's how it is, and that felt like felt like a cheating answer. You know, it seemed like there should be a true answer that we can believe, and not just not just uh, you know, deciding to ignore these things that are inconvenient. So I was asking the youth pastors for advice and they would recommend that I read all these books. So I read Mere Christianity and I read Lee Strobel and I read all those, all those books that are supposed to prove God's existence and none of, none of them really were compelling to me at that time. And it's because um, I think that for people who have lost their faith in God, that there's not really any argument that's going to change their mind. They have to experience God in a more visceral way. That's kind of what I was waiting for. And I wanted some confirmation of something supernatural, so I did all kinds of stupid stuff. I would go out to the cemetery at night on my bike, and I would stand there, and I'd be like, hey, if anybody's there, <laughs> say something. <laughs> you know, let me know you're here. <laughs> and of course, they never did. And so my uh, faith in God grew smaller and smaller and smaller. And then the major problem came when my youth group, or rather the, uh, the, the elders at my church, decided that because I had been posting on social media all my, my concerns about religion and stuff, that uh, it would be very bad if I continued to be around all their kids. And so they asked me to stop coming to the church. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so I'm like 16 years old, and all the adults have just like, have just like, like shunned me from the community. And so. And uh, you know that uh, that didn't feel very good. And then at, shortly after that, all these uh, people in my life who didn't believe in God were like, "Good for you! You're so brave! You're so brave for telling the truth!" And you're being persecuted, and that made me feel really special. And so that led to the next arc of my life, in which I was a very angry, uh, very uh, spiteful, uh, sacrilegious atheist. And. So as soon as I graduated from high school, I went to college at UNI, and I joined 
a uh, radical anti-religious student organization called the UNI Freethinkers and Inquirers. And the stated purpose of that group was to be sort of a group for irreligious people to spend time together, but the core members and the, the core uh, ideology and the core activities of that group mostly involved you know, being, uh, being uh, <laughs> I'm gonna say this nicely, being, being very unpleasant. So for example, we would, on September 30th, we would celebrate a day called Blasphemy Day. It was to mark the anniversary of an event where a Danish cartoonist drew a picture of the Prophet Muhammad and he got stabbed to death in the street by uh, angry uh, Wahhabists. And so that was a good excuse for us to pull out uh, sidewalk chalk and we would go out at two in the morning and we would write obscenities about the Blessed Mother and about Jesus and about every religion that we could think of all over the campus. Of course, it was mostly Christianity. Uh, and I'm talking, it was, it was bad. Like every square inch of campus, we just, we just cut, plastered with this stuff. And it was very vulgar and very gross. And the next morning, holy smokes, we got into probably the most, the most dramatic event that that campus had ever seen up to that point. There were like 400 people standing outside the student union and we were standing in the center and they were all yelling at us. And the government of Egypt declared a fatwa against our student organization. Like it was, it was really over the top. And uh, unfortunately that had the effect of solidifying our, our fantasy of being persecuted. And you know, we, 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 we would do all these things with the idea being that it was all about free speech. It's about, it's about being able to be free and having free expression, but that wasn't really it, you know? Like the reason that I wrote, you know, Lord forgive me for this. Uh, the reason that I wrote God equals poop on all of the bricks of the, walk, the brick walkway that goes up to the student union was because I wanted to make fun of Christianity and I thought it would be funny. That was the only reason. The, pr the free speech thing was just a convenient ex excuse to get away with it sure. and to say, oh no, 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 it wasn't me. It wasn't me, I'm just, I'm fighting for freedom here. I'm a freedom fighter. And so, so we did all kinds of stuff like that. We would, we would pass out contraception on Good Friday and we would, uh, you know, we would protest in favor of abortion and we would, uh, you know, we would go to all the pro-life events and try to crash them. And we would uh, go to all the religious speakers who came to campus and try to crash those events and we'd hold up signs. It was totally outrageous. And so... Sounds like a fun group, geez. Well, we had lots of fun, but it wasn't a good kind of fun. And as you can imagine, a group of people like that get up to bad business after hours and I was involved in all that kind of stuff as well. And so... That uh, was not a great time. Of course, at the time, I thought I was having the greatest time ever. Sure. It, seemed, it seemed really great at the time. But uh, the, uh, it eventually leaves you feeling kind of hollow. And I think the big break with that was around the time of graduating. I started to become a little bit disillusioned with the student group because I was frustrated with the way uh, for one, I was frustrated with the way that they, they treated the Muslim students on campus because the reality is that there's like, there's like a handful of, of Middle Eastern people who are Muslim on campus and when we would go out of our way to like draw pictures of, of Mohammed, it was, you know, to, just to attack Islam, it just seemed kind of mean-spirited and, I, you know, like, like what's the point, you know, to make, make those people feel bad and so, and they would say, no, 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 we have to because of free speech. And I was like, you know, didn't really sit right with me. And so, and then some other things happened as well. So I won't go into too much detail here, but suffice to say the group started to kind of go off the deep end politically. For a long time, it was just about being edgy, being contrarian, being against religion, but it started to become more and more wrapped up in politics, specifically pushing various uh, left-wing causes that I didn't necessarily agree with. And then as soon as I started to voice opinions about these things, these people who I thought were like my dearest friends were like, they were like, they, they didn't want anything to do with me anymore. Mm. So they kind of left me out in the cold and they, uh, you know, as far as they were concerned, I was, you know, I had, I had crossed a line and there's, there's no forgiveness in that religion. That's not, a, that's not a religion where people forgive each other. That's one where when you commit a sin, like it's over, you're done. And so after, Leaving college, we moved to Minneapolis, my wife and I. So I got married at this time. This is another uh, thing that was very uh, 
difficult for me to reconcile. Uh, I knew from the time I was about seven years old that I wanted to get married and have a family when I grew up. I didn't exactly know why, it just seemed like what I was supposed to do. And, you know, and I, I greatly admired my father, who, by the way, throughout this entire thing, my dad and my mom were so patient and kind, and they, had, they never had any harsh words for me about this whole thing. You know, and as far as they were concerned, you know, these were my mistakes to make, and their job was to be, uh, to be there when I was ready to be over it, and they were. And so I'm thankful for that. But anyway, so I, I got married. But according to the ideas that I professed to believe in this whole time, there was no reason for me to get married. Marriage is an outdated social construct by patriarchal uh, bigots from the Bronze Age, right? And, uh, you know, humans aren't meant to be monogamous, and having children is bad for the environment. And so, but I didn't actually believe those things. Not in my heart. I wanted to believe those things. I convinced myself that those things were reasonable, but they weren't. And I knew in my heart that they weren't. And so um, I had kind of this identity crisis, and this, this enters kind of a second dark period of my life where I was very depressed and where nothing in my life made sense because it was like, you know, all the things that I professed to believe so strongly in for the last, you know, six or six years of my life, you know, it turns out I didn't believe them at all and they weren't right. And so uh, I'm thankful for my wife's perseverance in that time and her patience with me. But, so I started to, um, I started to um, get to a point where I, uh, be, as I, I tend to be kind of an extremist in everything I do. And so when I stopped being a, uh, a left-wing uh, atheist radical, I decided to go as far as I possibly could in the other, in the other direction, and I became kind of a far-right occultist. <laughs> and so I thought, you know, wow, if I'm going to believe, I believed only in science and only in, you know, academic uh, political philosophy before, and now I think I'm going to uh, worship Satan and, uh, you know, believe in uh, the most outlandish theories I can possibly imagine. Like Atlantis believed it, Hyperboreans believed it, uh, you know, space uh, aliens building the pyramids, I believed it, you know, just because, it, not, not even because I actually did, but because I wanted to see what would happen if I did. What would happen if I, like, if I, like, tried to believe this crazy, ridiculous thing for a while? And it was uh, a very strange period. <laughs> but uh, something that pulled me away from that over time was that uh, I was always, I think, being drawn towards the truth. And I think I knew in my heart this whole time that there had that I, I couldn't just believe silly things because it was funny. I had to believe something that was true, and I had to find what was true. There was an old, there's an old G.K. Chesterton quote that uh, I read at some point that stuck in my mind for a long time, where he says, "The object of opening your mind is to close it again on something solid." And so, it became sort of silly to me how these people who were into the occult and into neo-paganism they would believe things that just weren't true. Just, be, just, like, just because it was fun and because it was convenient. You know, they were willing to believe that uh, you know, the, in the Hyperborean race from Atlantis, and I was like, but, but not only is that ridiculous, but some guy made that up like 100 years ago. That's not, that's not ancient wisdom. That's something, that's, that's, fan, that's fan fiction. But it didn't matter, right? Because, because for, for them, it's like a game. But this wasn't a game for me. I wanted to know what was true. I wanted to know what was real, and so, I started kind of jettisoning, jet, j jettisoning the things that were more ridiculous and gravitating towards the things that made sense. Basically, I wanted to figure out what the real paganism was. What was the real religion that people believed in before Christianity? Because all this time, I've still got my baggage about Christianity. I'm still upset at my youth pastors, and I'm still believing a little bit the uh, people who told me that I was persecuted you know, because my parents took me to church you know, very kindly. <laughs> But, um, and I just, uh, eventually it became abundantly clear to me that uh, whatever is true in, in paganism survives only in Catholicism. Because when Catholicism went to other countries and it found people practicing pagan religions, it said to them, hey, some of this stuff you're doing here, it's not gonna fly but some of these other things are like a revelation from God that was meant to prepare you to receive the truth. 
right? My ancestors, the, the Scandinavians, you know, they have a myth about their god uh, hanging on a tree and dying. And the missionaries used that and said, oh, you have a guy who hangs on a tree, so do we. But ours rose from the dead. He didn't die. And they thought that was so cool. And they were, and they, and they, they were, they were inspired by that. And that's, that's, that's true in many other places. It reminds me of when St. Paul went to Mars Hill and, and was walking around and saw the inscription to the tomb of an unknown God or, whatever, or the inscription to an unknown God. And he said, what you worship that you don't know, we now declare to you. So he didn't yeah. basically say everything you're doing is horrible. He tried to find that connection point to what they already believed and connect it to Christ. And it sounds kind of like the same thing. Mm -hmm. So around this time, I met my godfather. So I, I was still on the internet having stupid debates with people throughout this whole thing. And I said something really dumb about Catholicism. And I think he responded to my comment and all he said was, are you sure that's what Catholics believe? <laughs> and I said, I think so. He said, oh, well, I'm, I, I can assure you that it's not. And would you like to have coffee sometime to discuss it? And so his name is Dr. Robert Steed. He's a professor at uh, Hawkeye. He's also a Tolkien scholar, and he himself is a convert to Catholicism from uh, Buddhism. And his godfather actually is also a convert from Buddhism. And he, uh, he studied with a man who I uh, admire, and for some reason I can't think of his name right now. <laughs> but he, uh, he was, a, he was a, a, a student of a school of thought called perennial traditionalism. So not to send people down this rabbit hole, but it was, it was, it's basically an, it's an occult way of thinking. And this guy was a Catholic who studied this way of thinking and who sort of distilled from it what was, uh, what was good and what made sense. And so anyway, so my godfather converted to Christianity and he started talking to me and he, he knew more about religion, knows more, he's still alive. <laughs> he knows more about religion, about every religion than I probably ever will. And he knows more about all these myths and all these languages and all these ideas. And, he just blew my mind with all these things, and he—he never—he he was never pushy about Catholicism, but he, we would uh, we would meet and we would talk for three or four hours about the Lord of the Rings and the Silmarillion and J.R.R. Tolkien, and he would explain to me how all these things inside of that story are you know, directly out of Catholicism. You know, there's so many so many uh, women in the story are like, like types of Mary. So many of the men in the story, in particular Frodo and, and Gandalf and Aragorn are, are types of Christ, you know, the, prophet, the priest, the prophet, and the king. And you know, I thought it was so fascinating. And uh, Lord of the Rings, by the way, was very special to me because my dad read it and because I you know, read it many times as a kid and I grew up you know, listening to the book on tape every single night before I went to bed. So, so to, to make that connection was really big. That was a big personal thing where I started to kind of feel God in a visceral way. And so going forward from there, I resolved to try going to Mass. So I went to, I think the first church I went to was St. Pius here in town. And I sort of went and I tried out all the different parishes and I had this idea like, oh, I'll go. Maybe I'll become Catholic because it'll be convenient. You know, maybe my, my kids can go to the Catholic school and you know, maybe I'll, I'll find some people who can babysit my kids because you, you don't want neo-pagan occultists to babysit your kids, trust me. And which, which I, had, I had one at this time. And then eventually I stumbled into Immaculate Conception for the first time. And it was the most, it was the most, out of all the parishes in town here, I think they had the most sort of uh, conservative liturgy, and that really spoke to me. And so I talked to my godfather about this, and he said, oh, well, I see that the uh, parish St. Wenceslaus has a traditional Latin mass. You might really like that. And so he gave me one of the little red books, and he said, uh, why don't you check it out? And I didn't, because I was terrified for some really? reason. <laughs> I think I think there was, there was somebody who didn't want me to go, I think. And I think you know, you know who I mean. But for uh, the longest time, I just... I could not get myself to go. I was, I was, I was just so nervous about it. And then uh, I met with Father Podaski, and we talked about some things. And we talked for a couple hours, and he scared me. <laughs> he was like, this man was like, it was like he had one foot in heaven and one foot on earth. I have had those conversations with him as well. And he was just going back and forth. And I had never met somebody like this, who, you know, a, a truly kind of mystical sort of person. And he, 
he, he scared me, but I was also very intrigued because I thought, you know, if I'm going to do this, this is what it's all about, right? This is, this, yeah. this is the serious stuff right here. And so he, he, uh, he told me in no uncertain terms that if I was going to become Catholic, I should do it because it's the truth. Not because of Catholic school, not because it could be convenient, not because I could, uh, you know, be a, be a bad Catholic and get away with it, but because it's true the truth. And, you know, that, and, but before I left his office, because I probably would have stormed out into Hoff, but he sent me up to have lunch with uh, our friend Alec Silau, and uh, he, he called Alec on the phone right there, and he, and he told him that we were having lunch the next day or something, and Alec was just like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, and I left, and he, he pulled me in for a hug, and he, and he says in my ear, he says, make sure you have lunch with Alec. So I said, okay, I will, I will. <laughs> so, so I did. And Alec was a little bit more harsh with me the first time we met. He, uh, he told me the truth, right? Because I had, I had told him my kind of lazy reasons for thinking about becoming Catholic. And he said, he said it's great that you want to become Catholic, but you know, that's, that's not really a good reason. Like, like, this is the truth. This is not a truth. This is not you know, somebody's version of the truth. This is the truth. And if, you're, if you can't assent to that, then I can't in good conscience you know, have you start you know, coming into the church right now. And I said, okay. And I got so mad I didn't talk to him for like six months. I stopped going to mass. I started moping around. Started, uh, you know, being really into into getting in internet arguments again for a while. I kind of distracted myself from it. But the the pole was there. The hook was in, and and Jesus was reeling me in. And about seven or eight months later, I f I finally went back to mass, and this time I went to the Latin mass finally. And that was where it all really clicked for me because up until then I wasn't quite sure what made being Catholic different from being any other kind of Christian. You know, they have communion too, right? Yeah. But at the Latin Mass, it was demonst it's demonstrated in a very flamboyant and, op and very serious way that that is Jesus there on the altar, that is his body, that is his blood, and that this is real, this is serious, this is not a game. And you know, and the, the, the honor that is shown to our Lord at the altar just, just uh, overwhelmed me. It was a very moving experience. And I left there that day, and I met Father Podaski on the steps, and he, he said, uh, he looked right at me. I, I hadn't seen this guy in like eight months. I'm surprised he even remembered me. He looked at me and he said, you finally made it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and... So I called Alec that same day, and I said, I think I'm ready. And we uh, met up for RCIA, and uh, my wife came with me, and uh, the two of us were baptized on Easter Sunday, or sorry, at the Easter Vigil in uh, April of 2019. Here we are, trying to, trying to do this Catholic thing. Wow, I remember meeting you and talking to you about what you did for a living and you, you had mentioned that you were a personal trainer and, and I remember that you weren't quite Catholic but, there, but you were interested enough to come to a, a guy's house to talk about uh, Augustine, I think we were talking about the confessions or something like that and I remember thinking, okay, there are some, I'm meeting all these interesting people <laughs> that, are, that are Catholic and then when I, I remember seeing you coming into the church, I'm like, oh yeah, there's that Joe guy, I remember him and then, you know, of course, the Latin Mass for us as well has been a has been a big thing. And then I remember when you had said you were going out on your own to start this gym and uh, being interested in that and, of course, getting involved. In it. And it seemed to me like, uh, I mean, although we had sung in choir together in the Latin Mass and done a few different things, when I got around you in the gym, I was like, oh, this is a different guy than what I've seen in these other environments because you're a very quiet, sort of reserved person when you're in those environments, but when you're in the gym, it's like Joe comes to life. And it's very apparent to me that this is your, this is your, your happy place. Yeah. And you know, this is like the third iteration of gym since I've known you, you know, we started out in your house and then into this big storage unit and then now into this amazing place. But tell us kind of your journey with this whole fitness thing and, and, and how you got here doing this. Yeah. And why a Catholic gym? I mean, I know we kind of call this sort of a Catholic gym. We don't, it's not only for Catholics, but I mean, St. Michael, we got holy water, we got all this great stuff. So 
fitness was something that was definitely in parallel with the spiritual life for me. So as I mentioned, I was kind of a socially awkward uh, high school kid. I was fat, I had really bad posture, I spent a ton of time on my computer. And like a lot of teenagers in that position, I fell for the, I had this delusion that if I got in shape and had muscles, that that would fix all my problems. It doesn't fix your problems, but uh, it, it, it helps with some things, and it teaches you a lot of valuable lessons. So I started getting serious about the gym my sophomore year of college, and uh, I, uh, you know, I, I started from absolute ground zero. I'm like pe people see me now, they're like, "Oh, you're so lucky that you're in shape." I'm like, you got no idea. You got no idea where I came from, dude. <laughs> I remember doing squats with the empty barbell and like hurting my back really bad doing deadlifts with like 200 pounds, and uh, I just had horrible flexibility and stuff. I had to undo all those years at the computer very slowly. And it took me a long time to uh, get to a point where uh, I was able to do everything safely and effectively. And all throughout that time, there, there are things about the gym that are just very compelling on a spiritual level. Because the gym is a place of objectivity, right? The ideology I was professing to believe through college was one where you know morals are mostly relative and the standards that we believe are all cultural constructs. But 200 pounds, is 200 pounds, and there is no cultural construct or no way of explaining that away. And a guy who can lift 200 pounds is stronger than one who can't. And that is always true. There is no changing that objective truth. That is, and that is something that you know was always in the back of my mind because uh, you know, I was the only one of my friends who actually lifted weights in college. And so I, uh, I was meeting all these different kinds of people at the gym, and one of them is actually my very good friend Joe, who you've met, uh, Joe Brandenburg, who is a world-class powerlifter, and he was actually the first Catholic friend that I ever really had. Um, and I always thought it was so strange, because for him, being Catholic is just a matter of fact. You know, it's not, it's not his personal belief, it's not his personal choice. You know, he's Catholic because he's Catholic. You know, he'd, he'd, he'd say, I gotta go, I gotta go, I gotta go to Mass, and be like, why? Because I'm Catholic. <laughs> that, was, that was it, you know? And I, that was always very intriguing to me. And it was, for him, his faith ser serves as kind of an anchor for everything else that he does. And a lot of people say that, you know, my faith is my rock, my faith is my reason for everything. But I, I actually observed it in my friend Joe, and that was very interesting. But so I, start, so I was working out at college, and then I went to the University of Minnesota and uh, so, this is a, to, not to backtrack again, but so when you're, when you're like a militant atheist in 2010, 2011, you think that you're also a scientist. And so I decided I needed to go to graduate school to be a scientist. And so I went and I talked my way into a, a neuroscience uh, graduate research program. And so I, I, didn't, I wasn't uh, qualified for the graduate program yet, but they let me work in the research lab to build credit for that program. And so while I was there, I wanted to make some money because the graduate research lab didn't pay very much. So I started working as a personal trainer because I'd had a few years experience and it wasn't that hard to get certified and stuff. And I found that that was what I actually liked doing. And I hated going to the lab and I loved going to the gym to train people. And so uh, a few, uh, you know, tens of thousands of dollars later, I, uh, I didn't drop out, but I, I took my credits and I got a second bachelor's degree. And I said, okay, I'm, I think I'm just going to stick with this training thing. So I was working at a gym in Minnesota and my wife was working up there. And uh, we were both kind of looking for an excuse to get out of that big city of Minneapolis and back home because uh, I grew up in a town with 300 people. Like, I cannot live in a city with a million people in it. I just can't do it. That to me, <laughs> that to me is, the, is, is, is a form of uh, torture. And so as soon as a job popped up here in town in Cedar Rapids, uh, she took it and we moved on down. And uh, you know, I was working at a gym here and then I recognized as a personal trainer that uh, working at a gym was something where you didn't make very much money because the gym was providing you with the space and the equipment, and so they, they took a hefty cut of whatever people were paying. And so I recognized that if I had a gym in my house, which, and for my style of training, I didn't need very much. I needed a bar, a rack, a bench, and some weights. Uh, if I had that stuff, I could train people on my own, and I could make twice as much money 
with uh, you know, while, while, while people pay me less than they would be paying the gym I was working at. So I built that gym, I saved up, I bought a rack and a bar and some weights, and uh, I started bringing people in to do workouts. And I wasn't Catholic yet at this time, so I just kind of had this hodgepodge of different people. And they would come to my house and they'd work out in my basement. And after I became Catholic, you know, everyone's, everyone always wants to know what you do for a living. So I'd tell them I teach people how to lift weights in my basement. And so uh, people from the parish started asking if they could come by and check out the personal training. And so I had uh, a handful of guys, you know, our friend Tom, our friend Phil, they'd come down, and our friend Alec came too. And uh, that was cool. It was fun. And then uh, two things happened. We had the lockdowns of 2020, which was good for my business because I, I wasn't very concerned about those. And so when all the other gyms in town closed, I picked up some extra business, which was very cool. But then we had the derecho, which I'm sure you remember. Maybe you've talked about it on your channel before. That's the big storm where a hurricane blew through Iowa <laughs> and destroyed everything. And you know, by the grace of God, we did not have a lot of damage, but it, uh, it caused a major uh, hiccup in business because there was no power and no electricity, no internet for you know, weeks and weeks. And so I couldn't have people over to work out. And on top of that, our third child was born, and my wife was tired of uh, people coming and going from our house all day long. And so I used that opportunity to try something new. Because during the Durate show, you know, in the recovery afterward, I think the guys who had been working out with me at the gym, they came to recognize that working out is beneficial, not just for feeling good, looking good, whatever, but for when you have you know, eight hours worth of uh, pulling down uh, destroyed trees and, uh, you know, picking up refrigerators out of people's uh, driveways and stuff and, and putting them away. Like, all that stuff was so much easier for my guys who had been coming to the gym, and they felt it and they knew it, and they found more guys who were interested in getting involved. And so we, we sort of became kind of a brotherhood at that point. Before it was a bunch of guys coming to my gym, paying me for training, and now we were, we were like a team. And so I used that three weeks of no electricity to uh, you know, use the internet at my in-laws house and find some place to rent. Because I figured you know, I had a budget, I said I can afford this much, and you know, inexplicably, unless if you don't believe in God, inexplicably, a uh, place popped up that was very affordable and the landlady was very kind and she let me move in right away and so September 11th 2020 I signed that lease and a couple weeks later we were all in there working out doing our uh, doing our group classes and you might uh, you might remember those those classes where we had eight guys and we did the timers it. and stuff that was a lot I of fun. I loved them they were great yeah. Yeah. and but at that point things uh, changed a little bit because I had I was recognizing that People do not, pe most people cannot afford personal training. Like personal training is too expensive for most people. And I didn't like that, I didn't like, you know, knowing that there were people who wanted to work out at our gym who it was like prohibitively expensive because everyone coming to the gym was Catholic. We weren't yet the St. Michael Barbell Club, but you know, it was, it was largely, you know, a church organized thing. And I had all these guys from church helping me out. And it, you know, would break my heart to tell somebody, you know, yeah, this is what it costs, and then see the look on their face, and they're like, yeah, yeah, no way I can swing that. And so I wanted to set it up so that people could just come to the gym like a gym membership and just come in and, you know, because obviously I got I to gotta pay bills, and I can't spend 80 hours a week training people for, you know, five bucks an hour. I got I to, gotta, I gotta, you know, be, it's got to be worth my time to some degree. So I changed the gym model to be one where you know you you paid your membership, you got a code or you got a key, and you could just come in wherever you want, and that's how uh, the gym got to its current iteration. We moved to this location because after one year in the hot box, we uh, I was I was tired of the elements. It was absolutely brutal in the summer, and it was freezing cold in the winter, and I was uh, I was ready to uh, pay whatever I had to to get some air conditioning. So. We uh, moved here in October 2021. Uh, once again, extremely uh, fortunate to find this place, extremely blessed, I should say. Um, the uh, landlords are very, very kind, very helpful. They've been very generous and very patient with me, even, uh, even with uh, you know, all the noise we make down here. And uh, it's just been a ton of fun. It's been a blast. And 
he said that the gym is like my happy place, and yeah, you're right. Uh, this, is, this is something where when I come here, you know, I feel like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. You know, this is something where I have something that I'm good at, that I know a decent amount at, where I can inspire people and motivate people, and where I can kind of put on, put on the, uh, the trainer hat, and it's like I become a different person, and I like it. It's, it's, it's intoxicating, and it's definitely a blessing. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not uh, getting rich off this gym or anything, but it's, uh, it is a dream job. It is so much fun, and I feel so fortunate to have this place. Well, it's been really amazing to be a part of it and to see all of the, you know, you mentioned that aspect of the team and, and just as somebody who, who comes here when I can, when I'm not traveling, it's like the relationships that I've formed with guys from the parish as working out together, it's now like that next level of, of friendship. And, you know, of course, the rosary is done here. If you, if you people have seen this place on the rosary crew, and we've prayed the rosary down here on the first Saturdays at times. And uh, so people are sort of familiar with that because you don't shy away from your own, you know, you don't require that people are Catholic to come here, but you're also pretty out front with it. And I think that's been helpful to people in the church who are like just looking to connect, you know, with other people. What are, what are some of the other things that you think are helpful when it comes to a person's faith that they can learn from just plain working out? Oh yeah. Um, so for starters, just like a spiritual life, you make progress in the gym by showing up, by having a plan, by having a consistent routine, by doing things sometimes that you don't want to do, by doing things sometimes that scare you, by taking risks, by um, you know making sacrifices. And the spiritual life is very similar. I mean, people. Some people don't like doing this, but I'm telling you, your prayer life will be better if you set an alarm on your phone that says to, to stop, you know, playing, uh, playing uh, games on your phone and, you know, pray. Pray the Angelus, pray the Rosary, do something. And doing that every day will lead you to new insights and new levels of enlightenment as you spend more and more time in prayer and more and more time reading the scriptures, more and more time challenging yourself. And it's even better if you don't want to do it. If you really don't want to do it, good. That's the exact right time to do it. Sounds like you know? no pain, no gain. Precisely, you know? And there are so many things you can, you can do. There, there, there are so many spiritual things you can do that are like workouts, you know, like going to adoration or Praying the rosary. Pray, praying the rosary is like is like the one mile run of uh, of spiritual exercises. You know, it's something that you know it it takes a little bit of getting used to, but it doesn't take very long, and it's kind of a basic standard activity that everyone should be able to do and everyone should have time for. And then uh, things like fasting also are very good. You know, these are these are you know if, if you think of them like spiritual workouts, it makes them easier to wrap your head around the challenge. Because of course fasting is supposed to be hard. It's supposed to be hard. People say, I can't, I can't fast because I'll be hungry. I'll be tired in the afternoon. Good, you're supposed to That's be. That's the point. <laughs> you know? and so, and it's just like, you know, I can't, I can't lift weights because it'll be heavy. It's supposed to be, right? And it, uh, it just carries over so well and it just makes so much sense. And the added benefit of working out as opposed to other hobbies which can teach you similar lessons is that it makes your body useful. And I don't know about most guys, but so some people are blessed with bodies that are very sickly or who, you know, they, maybe they're, they're hermits or maybe they're monks or maybe they're 90 years old and they don't need to be strong. That's not me. That's not you. That's not most guys. I'm a father. I'm a husband. I'm a member of a community where people need help with stuff all the time. Like if I'm not being strong, I am sinning. If I'm allowing my body to degenerate and to become useless, I am sinning. And by training, I put myself in a position where at any time I can help somebody. If, if somebody calls me and they need to move furniture or something in their house broke, or if there's an, you know, a, uh, you know, an old woman who needs help uh, you know, doing stuff around her house or if you know, she needs help uh, fixing her car or something, like, like I can do those things because my body is strong. And because that, and that, that allows me to fulfill my job as a man, as a, as a lay man in the faith. Every father has a, has a, 
has an obligation to be able to protect his family in some capacity. Now, we can all fantasize about, oh, somebody breaks in and I do this or that, but it's not even, it's not even that. It's, a lot of times protecting your family is just a matter of being capable so that people don't think that they can take advantage of you. you know, I know that you know, because I'm very tall and I'm big and strong, people assume, people don't assume that they can steal from me, that they can break into my house, that they can hurt me, that they can hurt my family and get away with it. Now, I'm a big softy, but it doesn't matter because people don't assume that and I don't want them to. And you know, I think so many men would benefit so greatly from recognizing their responsibility to be strong. Unless someone has a very good reason to not be physically strong, I think being physically weak is a sign of being spiritually weak as well. Hmm. Right. Now, if somebody has a disability, you know, they can't help that. I don't hold that against them. But if someone is in perfectly good health, except they weigh 350 pounds and haven't gone for a walk, haven't, haven't walked more than 400 yards in 20 years, I say, what's, what's wrong, man? Why don't you take better care of yourself? Don't you owe it to yourself, to your family, to your friends, to your church, to God, to take care of the body that he gave you? So that was a little, little, bit, a little bit of a soapbox there. But uh, I feel very strongly about this, which is why I, I, uh, I sort of evangelize the gym to people. It's not just about getting gym memberships. It's about surrounding our community with capable men because you don't know what's going to happen. There could be another derecho. There could be something worse. And the more guys who are able to, to help out in those situations, the better. Now, you talk a lot about men, but you do also have women that come here, too. Yes, I mean, sorry. I, I've I seen them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to talk so much about men. Obviously, as a man, I talk more about men, and I am more concerned with, uh, with you know, how, I can, how I can get other men on the same page. But yes, our, our gym is probably about 60, 40 men, women. Uh, we have women who come in groups and work out. We have moms and daughters. Um, it's very important for women to exercise as well because uh, just like men, your body degenerates from being too sedentary. And in the world we live in today, most people, even if they're not trying to be lazy, are very sedentary. Maybe you have a job where you're at a desk all day long. Maybe uh, you know, you, everything, all the tr work in your house is done by machines, so you, you spend most of your t a lot of time watching TV and stuff. And if your body degenerates, it will, it will be in a state where you will experience signs of old age long before your time. You know, I've, I've met women with osteoporosis in their 30s or 40s because they were so sedentary and their diet was so bad for in, their, in their teens and 20s that their, their body just rapidly reached you know, the, these stages. And you can prevent all these things by exercise, by working out, by building muscle, building bone. And I think a lot of people get really caught up in how do I look, how much do I weigh, what does the scale say, what size of uh, shirt can I fit in. And I, I always, I try to discourage that at this gym. This is not, this is not a, you know, take picture, take progress pictures and, you know, be really worried about your body kind of gym. I don't, as you can see, there's not even any mirrors in here. Yeah, that's interesting. This isn't a vanity gym. This is like a utilitarian gym, you know. Because I want people to focus on, you know, how can I be capable? How can I live longer, not for its own sake, but so that I can be there for my children and for my grandchildren. How can I look better, not, not for its own sake, but because like God made human beings and he made human bodies. And the ideal form of the human body that God has in mind is beautiful. And when our bodies are not beautiful, it's because they've degenerated because of sin, right? It's not, it's not uh, you know, and, and although we cannot be perfectly uh, sinless in this life, we can strive to be closer and closer to the ideal. And it's the same thing is true with our bodies. You know, just because our bodies degenerate in this world doesn't mean we have to allow them to do it you know, at a faster rate than necessary, especially when uh, most of us have responsibilities that we've got to take care of. Yeah. Well, I can tell you, like, for me, this, it's, been, it's been awesome. And if you've, you know, people read my book, you've heard, they've read me, They've read my chapter about where I talk about how, you know, working out with you and your guidance helped me to lose 30 pounds and get my blood pressure back under control and really get my own uh, health back, back in line where it was because I had a period of time where I was like during, during 2020, like everybody else, I just wasn't healthy at all. And it was like, it was getting serious and, and following, following your plan. Cause the other thing people need to understand is that you, you don't just help them with 
with what they do, you help them with what they eat too. So I know people are probably watching this and they're going, oh man, I wish I had a gym like that, but I don't live in Iowa, I don't live in, so by the way, if you live in Cedar Rapids, Iowa and you wanna come join us, uh, you can do that. But um, what would you say to someone who lives in like Utah or Delaware who says, man, I would love to be a part of, of a situation like that. I mean, do you offer any kind of online training or help to people? Yes, I do. So I coach people here at the gym. I also coach people online. I've currently got people all over the US. I've trained people in Europe and Australia before. Um, with online coaching, it's very similar to, to coaching people at the gym. The difference is that instead of instead of uh, yelling at you to your face, I'm yelling at you over the phone. No, I don't, I don't, do, a, I don't do very much yelling. No, he doesn't. But, um, <laughs> Yeah, so I, I uh, write people programs. They uh, send me videos of their exercises so I know they're doing them properly. I uh, give people guidance on their diet and uh, depending on what their goal is. A lot of people want to lose weight. Some people want to gain weight. And I have done both and I have struggled to do both. And so I, can, uh, I have a lot of uh, past experience to draw on with that. But uh, I've been working as a personal trainer. Uh, I, became, I got certified in 2014 in January, so almost 10 years now I've been, I've been training people. This has been my full-time and only job. And so uh, if you're watching this and you're coming from uh, somewhere that is not Cedar Rapids, I would be happy to work with you. You can reach out to me on Instagram, on YouTube, or on the website, stmichaelbarbell.com. Yeah, tell everybody how they can find you. So that's the website, stmichaelbarbell.com. Yes, so that's the gym website. It's got a lot of info on our, our story and it talks about some of the different uh, training options we offer. You can also find me on Instagram at St. Michael Barbell Club. Uh, or maybe it's at St. Michael Barbell. If you type St. Michael Barbell Club, I'll come up on Instagram. I'm also on Facebook. Uh, that's where I make connections with people. Usually I'll, I'll have you, uh, you know, we'll talk on the phone after we chat in direct messages or something like that and we'll figure out what works for you. Um, I also sell merchandise like this uh, fabulous flat build hat. Oh, I sell, sweet. I sell lots of shirts and hats and uh, flags and stuff like that. So, and you can support the gym by picking up some of that stuff if you want to. Um, always helps. We have lots of people who come to this gym. Well, not lots, but we we have people who come to this gym who, uh, you know, I I basically subsidize their membership because it's, uh, you know, they can't uh, afford it and it helps to, you know, get. To when, when people buy shirts. Once in a while I'll come out with a new shirt and I'll, I'll put some money aside for that so people can come to the gym because I care about getting the families here in town and you know people who I train online active and involved. And it's not just about you know making their bodies stronger but it's also you know, the, the confidence and the, the fun that they have when they're here. Some of these, some of these moms who come in here you know who you know they're you know, maybe they haven't exercised in like 20 years and they've just been they just been nonstop being moms for the last 20 years you know they come in with their their teenage son or daughter and they work out and they have a great time you know and and, and it's like it's like a switch turns on that just uh, you know they just they feel so much better about themselves and you know in general and you know that's the kind of thing I live for and so uh, you know that's the kind of thing I want to make happen at this gym and so if I if I gotta have, uh, if I gotta work extra hard for a little bit uh, less money to make that happen for somebody, I'll do it. But uh, it helps when uh, people are doing online coaching and when people uh, support the gym by buying merch. So, well, Joe, I want to thank you so much for taking time to be here, and I also want to thank you for what you said you would be willing to do for our Catholic feedback family here. Joe's going to offer a special discount to anyone who signs up. What do they need to do to, to get that, Joe? Yes, yeah, so if you reach out to me on any of my platforms, whether it's uh, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, or uh, if you sign up through the website, uh, just mention that you're here from Catholic Feedback and you'll get a special discount code. Excellent, excellent. Well, Joe, I want to thank you once again for just being an awesome guy for how you've helped me and how you've helped so many people in our town and our parish. I really feel like you and your gym are a gift to our community and to our parish life. And it's just been so awesome getting to spend this time together and, and learn more about your story, man. Thanks so much. And I'll see you tomorrow morning, right? For workout class? Six in the morning. All right, brother. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you guys for watching Catholic Feedback, my friends. Make sure you check out Joe. I've got all the links to everything in the description of this video. Sign up. Get in shape. I promise you, you'll have a blast. Joe is so much fun to work with. 
He'll, he'll help you. He'll walk you through it. You'll be happy if you did, friends. And just remember that when we talk about connecting the eternal truths, the Catholic faith to everyday life, your, your body's part of that too. So become strong in, in your soul and become strong in your body as well. And you'll be so happy that you did. So thanks so much for watching, my friends. Take care and God bless. Thanks for listening to Catholic Feedback with Keith Nestor. Send in your questions and comments to feedback at catholicfeedback.com. This podcast is brought to you by Stewardship, a mission of faith, and is also supported by our team at patreon.com forward slash Keith Nestor. Please consider joining our support team. Catholic Feedback is a production of Down to Earth Ministries. For more information about Down to Earth or to bring me to your parish or event, visit down the number two earthministry.org. See you next time.